Greetings, Bentley alumni, family, and friends, and a special greetings to all you future Falcons out there. Thank you for joining us once again for today's virtual event. I'm Emily Williams, Director of Alumni and Family Engagement. If you'd like more activities for your future Falcons, or yourselves, to be honest, we'll be releasing several Bentley-themed coloring book pages this weekend, so keep an eye on our social media channels for those. And now, today's featured speaker is David A. Kelly, MBA 93. David is an established children's book author, travel writer, and technology analyst. He's the author of the Ballpark Mystery Series from Random House, in which cousins Kate and Mike solve mysteries at different major league ballparks. David is also the author of several other children's books. He has written about travel and technology for the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Chicago Sun-Times, and many other publications. He lives in Newton, Massachusetts with his wife and two sons. Without further ado, please join me in virtually welcoming David A. Kelly. Thank you very much. I am happy to be here. It's uh, great to be sharing a little bit of time with you and to tell you a little bit about uh, my writing. Uh, so I'm David A. Kelly, as Emily mentioned, and I'm a proud uh, Bentley alumni. I actually did get an MBA in marketing from Bentley and had a great time uh, at the school. Uh, I do, did do a lot of writing when I was at Bentley. Uh, it was in the marketing and business area, but it has actually served me well as I have started to write children's books and travel articles and other things. So as Emily said, I am an author and uh, I'm the author of the Ballpark Mysteries series. This is a series of baseball mysteries set in MLB stadiums. And the two main characters here are Kate and Mike, their cousins. And they basically go to different stadiums to see a game or take a tour just the way that you would. And then they encounter a mystery. So in the first book, uh, they actually go to Boston's Fenway Park because I live outside of Boston. I thought that would be a great place to start. And they're watching batting practice and they're watching the Red Sox star hitter, Big D, um, hit a lot of home runs in batting practice. And then at the end of the first chapter, Big D's lucky bat gets stolen. So Mike and Kate have to figure out what happened to Big D's missing bat. In the second book, they actually go to Yankee Stadium. I figured I had to have a Red Sox-Yankees rivalry going on. So they go down to Yankee Stadium and they're watching a baseball game and they discover that there's a ghost at Yankee Stadium. Perhaps it's the ghost of Babe Ruth as you might be able to see on this cover. So they have to investigate why there's a ghost at Yankee Stadium. And then there's actually a series of other ballpark mysteries. Uh, they go out to the West Coast in the LA Dodger uh, they go to um, Houston and the Astro Outlaw, and they go to a bunch of other teams and stadiums. There's actually 16 stadiums, and the most recent stadium they go to is the uh, Colorado Rockies Stadium in Denver, Colorado. We'll be talking a little bit of more, more about this in a minute. In addition to those um, teams' books, there's actually four super specials with the Ballpark Mysteries, and these are kind of um, books that take place in multiple stadiums or in special places. So the first book is, uh, first super special, is a World Series super special called the World Series Curse. And it's a Chicago Cubs versus Boston Red Sox World Series. And there's lots of interesting things happening in this book. The second book in the super special is uh, Christmas in Cooperstown, it takes place at the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. That's actually where my characters, Mike and Kate live. And it's kind of a holiday themed book. They're actually doing a Christmas sleepover at the Hall of Fame. Wouldn't that be cool to be able to bring your sleeping bag to the Hall of Fame and sleep overnight there? Um, and a special baseball card, the Honus Wagner baseball card that's worth like $2 million, that gets stolen. So Mike and Kate have to figure out what's going on there. Uh, the third book is for you New York City fans. It's a Subway series called the Subway Series Surprise. So it's a Subway Series mystery. And it's a Mets Yankees subway series. It takes place in both stadiums and there's lots of cool things going on. And the most recent super special is called the World Series Kids. Um, this takes place in Williamsport, Pennsylvania at the Little League World Series. And uh, Mike and Kate aren't playing in the series, but the team from Cooperstown is, but someone is trying to um, basically jinx them or cause trouble for them. So Mike and Kate have to figure out what's going on there. So that's a quick overview of the Ballpark Mystery Series. I've also written another series of books called the MVP or Most Valuable Players. 
And the MVP books are basically set in an elementary school. And it's a group of five kids who form a club called the MVP club. And um, they basically play different sports and have mysteries. So the first book is kind of a school Olympics mystery. They're having a school Olympics and someone is messing up all of their events. Like there's a running race, but someone spreads oil all over the grass. So everyone slips and falls. And the MVP club has to figure out what's going on there. There's a, a soccer mystery, a football mystery, and a basketball mystery. So that's another series of books, great for kids in first to fifth grades that like sports, mystery, or adventure. Now, I've also written a couple of nonfiction books. Uh, so those books I just told you about were mostly fiction. Um, and I've written a couple of nonfiction books. And the first nonfiction book I wrote was Babe Ruth and uh, the Baseball Curse. And uh, this takes place in Boston. And any Bent Bentley alumni are going to know that uh, Babe Ruth and the Red Sox are kind of a big thing around here. And it basically tells the story of the curse. So Babe Ruth was a famous player for hitting a lot of home runs. And he started off playing for the Boston Red Sox. And when he was on the Red Sox, he was actually a pitcher. Uh, he played for the Red Sox for about three years. And after three years, the Red Sox traded Babe Ruth to their arch rivals, New York Yankees. And at that time, the Red Sox were actually a really good team. They had won five of the first 15 World Series, and the Yankees had won none. But after they got Babe Ruth, the Yankees, as we all know, started winning a lot of World Series, like 26 in the next 85 years. And the Red Sox couldn't win any. They had a lot of bad luck. And some people say they were cursed because they traded away one of the best players of all times to their arch rival, the New York Yankees. So this book tells you that story. And tells the story of all the bad luck that the Red Sox had and also the 2004 Red Sox season when they came back to win the World Series for the first time in 86 years. Now the other nonfiction book that I've written is actually this one. It's called Miracle Mud and it's a picture book. Uh, the other books are chapter books. This is a picture book so it's got lots of cool baseball pictures inside here. And I'll show you one example there. Some beautiful artwork and it tells the story of this stuff, Lena Blackburn baseball rubbing mud. So inside this tub is some nice brown mud. There you go. I think you can get a good view of that. Now it turns out this special mud is actually used on all Major League Baseballs. So before any baseball game, uh, before any Red Sox game or Yankees game, uh, the umpires or the clubhouse assistants have to rub about 80 or 90 baseballs with this special mud. And that's because a brand new baseball is made out of white leather and the leather can have a little bit of a shine or a gloss to it. I think you can see that gloss on the camera. And that shine or gloss can make it hard for the pitchers to hold on to. They're gonna hold on to it with their fingertips. They wanna be able to get a really good grip and throw the ball hard. But if the ball is slippery, they can't do that. So for a long time, baseball players tried to find a way to take the shine or the gloss off the baseball without ruining them. They tried things like soaking it in water. That made the baseballs too wet and soggy. They tried things like rubbing it with dirt from the field. That made the baseballs too dark and hard to see. They also tried things like spit or tobacco juice, which is kind of gross or smelly. And then along came a player by the name of Lena Blackburn. And Lena played about 75 years ago. So he's got kind of an old fashioned name. And Lena was thinking about this problem of the slippery, shiny baseballs. And he was trying to figure out how to fix it. And one day he went fishing near his house in New Jersey. There you go, I think I can show you the picture. And when he was fishing, he stepped in some mud and the mud gave him an idea. He picked up some of the mud he brought it back to the baseball stadium. He took the mud and he rubbed it on the baseball like this and it worked. The mud was just gritty enough that it took the shine or the gloss off the baseball without making it too wet or soggy or dark or smelly or stinky or gross. And so for the past 75 years, all the major league teams have been using this special mud on baseballs before a game. And again, I said, you know, any team has to rub 75 or 80 or 90 baseballs with the mud. The fun thing is the mud still comes from a secret place in New Jersey. Nobody knows where it is except the mud farmer who goes out and collects it every year, packages it up, 
and sells it to the major league teams. In fact, there was actually a pretty big article on this in Sports Illustrated um, last summer, if you want to look that up. So it's kind of a weird story. And that's actually one of the fun things about being an author is that I get to research interesting stories or make up interesting stories and find a way to share them with people. So that's kind of a quick overview of the books that I've written. And what I wanted to do next was actually share the latest book with you, The Colorado Curveball. So again, this is the 20th book in the Ballpark Mystery Series. It just came out in February. I'm really excited about it. And um, it takes place in Denver, Colorado. And I'll show you the close up there. You can see there's some snow on the ground. So the cousins, Mike and Kate, have gone to Denver, Colorado to see a Colorado Rockies game. It's actually opening day, but it turns out there's a snowstorm. So we had a little fun with them on the cover, had them pitching some snowballs at Kate so she could bat at them. And the field, as you can see, the stadium is covered with snow. And what I wanted to do before I read that first chapter to you is actually share some slides of the Colorado Rockies um, stadium and tell you a little bit about how I do the research for the books. So let me see if I can share the slides. Uh, do, 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 here we go. And I should be able to share it. So hopefully um, you should now be able to see a slide with all the books that I just walked you through. So again, that's an overview of my ballpark mystery series on the left that shows all 16 of the team books. On the right, we have the four super specials that I described to you, the four MVP books and the two uh, nonfiction books. So. When I start out to write a new ballpark mystery book, basically the first thing I do is research. So research is the first step in my writing process. And I'll start researching at home on the internet. I'll also go to the library and look at my library, my own library of baseball books that I have. And I'll look for information on the team or the stadium or the city that I'm writing about. And basically I'm just collecting lots of useful information that might or might not fit into the story. And then as soon as I feel prepared, then I'll take a trip to whatever team or stadium that I'm writing about. So a couple of years ago, I went out to Denver, Colorado, and I look around, I usually go to two or three baseball games. I'll take a lot of notes and a lot of pictures. Pictures are actually a really great way for me to remember details. Um, and it's a lot easier to write a story when you have details instead of having to make everything up. So if I'm just describing something I'm seeing in a picture, that can be really helpful for me. Um, I'll take a lot of notes. And um, I'll also take a tour of the baseball stadium, just the way you might take a tour of Fenway Park or Yankee Stadium. And again, lots of pictures, lots of, lots of notes. And then I'll usually look around the city uh, that this team is located in, because sometimes my characters of Mike and Kate, they go outside the stadium. Sometimes the mystery happens just inside the stadium, and other times it happens uh, in the city and they visit interesting places. So for example, in the San Francisco, um, mystery that takes place in San Francisco at the San Francisco Giants Stadium. My characters, Mike and Kate, actually get to ride on the cable cars that go up and down those great hills in San Francisco. And they get to go to Alcatraz, uh, which is this cool old jail in the middle of the harbor. And it was a lot of fun writing that book, actually, because um, Mike and Kate get to catch the criminal in jail. So that was kind of fun. So in the case of the Colorado book, I actually researched all kinds of interesting things in, in Denver and nearby. There's actually gold mines that you can go to out there. I went gold mining. Um, there are lots of cool things in the mountains. I didn't go skiing, uh, but my characters, Mike and Kate do. Um, and then I also researched everything in the baseball stadium. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the things in the stadium that you're gonna see, some of which you're gonna see in the first chapter that I'm gonna read to you. So you should see, let me move along here. You should see a slide with the Colorado curveball in front of you. And uh, one of the things I love about this cover, it's actually illustrated by Mark Mayers. He's illustrated all the books in the series for me. Uh, so this is the 20th cover he's done for me. And you can see the purple color on this cover. You can see Mike and Kate's jackets are purple. And that's because the team colors for the Colorado Rockies are purple. And their colors are purple actually because of the song, America the Beautiful. There's a line in there which goes, Purple Mountain Majesties. And that actually refers to Pikes Peak um, in the Colorado uh, Rocky Mountains. And um, they took their color from that song, from that line, the Purple Mountain Majesties. And I just love the way the purple comes out on this cover. 
So let me show you some of the things that I found when I went to the Colorado Stadium and when I started researching that I was thinking about as I started to write the book. So here's the first thing I was thinking about is snow. Uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, it can snow pretty late. It can even snow until May. And opening day is usually around April 1st or so. So this is a picture from opening day two years ago. I think it was, I think it was actually 2018. Um, they had snow on the field. Uh, opening day was delayed by a couple of hours. And the temperature at the first pitch was 27 degrees. So probably not the best day to go to a baseball game. Um, although they did have some fans that showed up that actually like that kind of weather. Uh, here's one of them. You can see the fan on the right. Looks like he's used to that kind of cold temperature. I thought that was kind of funny. So I thought I'd put that into my opening as actually, um, you know, one of the, one of the scenes that I, I set in the stadium. So that was the first thing I was thinking about, just the fact that the Colorado Rockies Stadium tends to be perhaps colder than some of the other major league stadiums. But of course, they do play uh, baseball in the summer. And there's a shot of the field, the Colorado Rockies logo on the field. Um, and hopefully we'll see green grass like that soon and be able to get outside on it. Here's a shot of the stadium. So you should see a nice shot of the stadium of the infield and the outfield there and the teams uh, actually getting ready to warm up. And what I wanted to point your attention to, uh, let me see if I can use my little uh, pointer here, annotate. And I'm just going to uh, spotlight here, let's see here. So this area right here, you can see this strip of seats that look like they're purple uh, that goes around the ring of the stadium. And I'll actually just show you a, a close-up of that ring of seats. Uh, should, let me see if I can navigate here. Whoops, whoops, sorry, I went the wrong way. Let's go back, there we go. There's the close-up. So what you're seeing should be a row of purple seats. So this is indeed a row of purple seats at the Colorado Rockies Stadium. This row of seats is actually at exactly one mile high. It's 5,280 feet. And they have a ring of seats that goes around the stadium to mark that one mile height. Um, it's the, it's, what's interesting about this uh, is that the Colorado Rockies Stadium is actually the the highest above sea level of any of the stadiums in the MLB. And it actually comes into play. I'll tell you a little bit more about how that comes into play in a minute. And you'll also note that I talk about it in the first chapter. Here's a graph. You should see a graph of the different stadium elevations. So this is how um, far above sea level each of the major league stadiums is. And you can see on the left, most of them are basically at sea level. The, the Red Sox, the Yankees, the Giants, San Diego, um, the Orioles, they're basically all at sea level. And then as you go across the chart to the right, some go up maybe 200 feet or 300 feet above sea level. But then the Colorado Rockies, uh, this is actually in meters. Um, so the Arizona Diamondbacks is, is about 1,000 feet or 1,200 feet above sea level. And the Colorado Rockies is actually 5,200 feet above sea level. So it's a big difference. And again, that actually comes into play a little bit in, uh, in the story. So another thing that's kind of interesting about the stadium, uh, again, when I go to the stadium to do research, I'm just looking for interesting things. Look at the scoreboard. Here's, a, here's kind of a close-up of the scoreboard, and you can kind of see up in this area, I don't know if you see my, my highlighter there, but um, you can see the scoreboard is basically shaped like the, the Rocky Mountains. So they kind of had a little bit of fun with the scoreboard. Instead of just a kind of a rectangular scoreboard, they made it shaped like the Colorado Rocky Mountains. And then another thing that's cool about the stadium is this is another shot. You should see another shot of the stadium and the scoreboard, but you can kind of see it's a little bit hard with the clouds, but in the background, there are some mountains uh, out beyond the city, and those mountains are the Rocky Mountains, the front range of the Rocky Mountains. And uh, if you go there on a clear day, it's really a beautiful place to watch a baseball game. It's a, it's a wonderful stadium and, and um, a lot of fun to see the, the scenery. Now, the fact is, uh, as I mentioned, the stadium is a mile above sea level, and that can have an effect on how far the baseballs travel. It can have an effect on the game. So when, the, when Coors Field, that's the name of the field, opened up, uh, it actually opened up in um, 1995, um, the teams were getting a lot of home runs. 
and uh, it was noticeably more home runs than in other ballparks. So they had to make some adjustments to the field. And, and this is a graph of, if you want to get into the science of it, baseballs hit at that altitude actually go farther. They travel farther. Now, initially people thought that was because there was less air resistance and there is less air resistance. The air is less dense at that height. Uh, but it actually turns out there's some other factors in play, and one of them is the dryness. So when you go up at that altitude, the air is actually drier than it is at sea level. There's less moisture or water in the air, and that actually affects the baseball. So it turns out the baseballs at the Colorado Rockies Stadium at Coors Field were drier than baseballs that you would find at most other major league stadiums. Now, when the baseball is drier, that means that it's actually harder. And when the bat hits it, the ball is going to bounce farther. It's going to rebound more. Uh, it's gonna have a higher rebound off of the bat. And so they found a solution to this some years after they opened. And the solution was actually to put the baseballs in a special room called a humidor, kind of like a special refrigerator. Uh, keeps it at a certain temperature, but more importantly, it actually keeps the baseballs at a certain moisture content. So it keeps them more at the moisture content that you'd find at other MLB stadiums. It adds some water to the baseballs, which makes them a little bit softer and makes them a little bit harder to hit farther. So of course, this is the kind of thing that I'm looking for when I'm researching my stories. I'm looking for interesting or different or unique things about the team that I can then kind of make a mystery about. So um, this actually plays a big part in the Colorado curveball. It doesn't play a part in the chapter that I'm gonna to read to you, but it actually becomes important later on in the story. And now it turns out that actually some of the other MLB teams have started to add humidors to make sure that their baseballs are controlled. So for example, the Arizona Diamondbacks, if you might remember that past chart, they were the team with the second highest baseball stadium. So they actually also have a little bit of dryness and a little bit of altitude um, that they want to correct for. So here's another shot of the humidor. This is the inside of it. They basically just have stacks of baseballs in this special room that again, that keeps the moisture at a certain level. And again, my characters, Mike and Kate, go into this room and they discover someone is basically kind of messing around with the baseballs and they have to figure out why. <coughs> so another thing I found out when I was out in Colorado uh, is that there were a lot of dinosaurs out there. So this is a picture of me with a friendly dinosaur. And uh, if you go west of Denver, Colorado, you can actually go to an area where there are lots of dinosaur tracks. Uh, it turns out they've discovered this whole area where dinosaurs used to roam and they've left many tracks and there's other fossils as well. And so that was really cool to investigate. And uh, this, for example, is an example of one of those tracks that they've actually done a mold of. And there's lots of cool information about baseball, about baseball, about dinosaurs. I wanted to include that in the book. So again, that will come into the story in two ways, and you'll see one of them in the first chapter that I read to you. And here is one of the most important dinosaurs for us. This is the uh, Colorado Rockies mascot. His name is Dinger, and uh, this is a picture of Dinger at spring training in Arizona that I took a couple of months ago. I got Dinger to uh, take a look at my copy of uh, the Colorado Curveball, and I think I got two thumbs up or maybe two horns up from, from him. Uh, but Dingo, Dinger is a fun mascot and uh, a really great addition to Colorado Rockies. And I think that might be the last slide. Let me just double check. It is. So I'm going to stop sharing. And um, so that was kind of an overview of how I do the research for the Ballpark Mystery Books. And what I wanted to do next was actually read a little bit of the first chapter to you from the Colorado Curveball, and then we'll take questions after that. So I'll be happy to answer questions about writing or about the books. So you've seen the cover, and I'm gonna read the first chapter. It's called A Surprise on the Elevator. And I'll show you the picture. There's a picture of Mike and Kate with the snow. Kate Hopkins stuck out her tongue. Soft white flakes drifted into her mouth and instantly disappeared. Snow, she asked, on opening day of baseball season? Don't worry, her cousin Mike Walsh replied. Big Bill, the Rockies pitcher, can definitely bring the heat. 
he'll need a flamethrower for this field, Kate said. You can't even see the graphs or the baselines. Kate was right. The Colorado Rockies field was white with snow. It looked like the middle of winter, but it was early April. Mike and Kate were in Denver with Kate's father for the opening day game against the Los Angeles Dodgers. Maybe we can solve the mystery of the missing field, Mike said. Kate shook her head. We're pretty good detectives, she said, but I don't think the Rockies need us to find the field. All they have to do is turn on the heater. Mike glanced at the thousands of empty, snow-covered seats. He looked past the mountain-shaped scoreboard to the Rocky Mountains off in the distance. This place is huge, he said. There's no way they can heat it up fast enough. Kate smiled. I'm not talking about heaters for the stadium, she said. I'm talking about the heaters under the field. The Rockies installed over 45 miles of heating wires to keep the grass warm enough to grow since it gets so cold up here in the winter. Fans wearing winter coats and hats had started to file into the stadium for the game. Down in the field, the grounds crew ran out to the infield with shovels. They started pushing piles of snow to the sides. Underneath, a big tarp covered the infield grass. Kate's dad, Mr. Hopkins, laughed quietly. Well, I guess I've seen it all now, he said. Mr. Hopkins was a scout for the Los Angeles Dodgers. He and Kate's mother were divorced, but he often invited Mike and Kate to meet him on his baseball trips. They had flown in from Cooperstown, New York, while he had traveled from his home in Los Angeles. Moments later, the sun peeked through the clouds. It lit up the snow and instantly made things feel warmer. The fluffy flakes at their feet started to melt. Mike used his sneaker to push some snow into a small pile. Aw, uh, why does it have to melt, he asked. If we had just a little bit more, we could have gone snowboarding and skiing right here. He jumped into his snowboard stance and held out his arms like he was cruising down a mountain. He bent back and forth as he pretended to carve through the snow. That would have been a real double play, baseball and snowboarding. Didn't you get enough snowboarding yesterday, Kate asked. The three of them had spent the day skiing and snowboarding west of Denver. You're the one who wanted to stop early in the afternoon. I didn't want to stop, Mike said. I just wanted to get some hot chocolate and rest a little bit. Mr. Hopkins nodded. The altitude around here tires you out more quickly unless you're used to it, he said. That reminds me. Look at that. He pointed to the row of purple seats that went all around the stadium up near the top. The purple seats, Kate said. That row is exactly one mile above sea level. Mike stood up from his snowboard crouch. I can't wait to try sitting up there, he said. From one mile up, I should be able to see everything in the world. Mr. Hopkins laughed. It's one mile above sea level, Mike, he said, not one mile above everything else around here. A buzz came from Mr. Hopkins' pop kit. He reached in and pulled out his phone. It's a message from the Rockies, he said. The game's been delayed by one hour because of the snow. I guess we should look around for some hot chocolate while we wait. With marshmallows, Kate said. They ran up the stairs to the main walkway and headed for the nearest food stand. Mr. Hopkins followed. Mike and Kate ordered hot chocolate while Mr. Hopkins ordered a coffee. To keep warm, they walked around the stadium with their drinks. Mike slurped up all his marshmallows first while Kate stirred hers into the cocoa. I knew I should have asked for extra marshmallows, Mike said. Kate laughed. Extra should be your middle name, she said, or maybe more. Mike scowled, or maybe super nice, he said. Mr. Hopkins' phone rang. Excuse me, he said. It's George. George was Mr. Hopkins' friend and the engineering manager for the Rockies. He had agreed to meet Mike and Kate before the game. Mr. Hopkins walked closer to the field and answered the phone. Mike and Kate continued sipping their drinks. Mmm, this is good, Kate said. She tilted the cup and finished her hot chocolate. Mike slurped up the last of his. He dropped the empty cup in a trash can and wiped the chocolate from the corner of his mouth. Now what, he asked. Kate's dad was still on the phone. How about a quick race now that we're fueled up, Kate asked. She pointed to the elevator at the far side of the entrance hallway. First one to push the button wins. Okay, go, Mike said. He took off running. Kate dashed after Mike and soon passed him. They ran neck and neck until they were just a few steps away from the elevator. Then Mike leapt forward and pushed the button. It lit up. I won, he said. Kate stopped and nodded. Yep, she said softly. They were just about to turn and head back when the button flickered off. Ding! The elevator doors whooshed open. Mike and Kate stepped back. Roar! A deafening growl filled the area. 
Before Mike and Kate could move, a giant dinosaur came out of the elevator and headed straight for them. And that's the end of chapter one. So I'll read a little bit more of chapter two so we can resolve the scene, see if Mike and Kate get eaten by the dinosaur. Chapter two is called a troublemaker for the Rockies. Mike and Kate jumped back. The dinosaur charged forward. Roar! Kate grabbed Mike's arm. Hang on, she said. That's not a real dinosaur. That's Dinger. Dinger the dinosaur stopped in his tracks. His head swiveled from Mike to Kate. Roar! He let out another loud bellow, but Kate stepped in front of him. Roar yourself, she said. We're not afraid. You went extinct over 65 million years ago. You're just a mascot for the Rockies. Dinger stopped charging at Mike and Kate. His head dropped. He leaned back and held out his hands. His arms were short and he had one little small horn on his nose and two horns poking out from the top of his head. He was purple from head to toe. And there's the picture there. Let's see, picture. Look at that, Mike said, a purple triceratops. He nudged Kate. I think he wants to be friends. Dinger nodded. He reached out and shook hands with Mike and Kate. There are tons of dinosaur bones and fossils in Colorado, and some are worth a lot of money, like millions of dollars, Kate said to Mike. I read about them on the plane ride here. That's one of the reasons they made Dinger the mas their team mascot. Do you know the other reason they did it? Mike glanced at Dinger. The dinosaur held up his small hands and shrugged. Um, no, Mike said. Because they found a triceratops bone when they built the ballpark, Kate said, right under the Rockies dugout. Dinger raised a hand to his mouth as if he were shocked. Mike smiled and reached out to Dinger for a high five. I'd say that's pretty cool, he said. Sounds like good luck to me. Dinger nodded happily. He gave Mike a high five and danced around a little bit, swinging out his tail out behind him and waving his short arms in the air. A woman next to Dinger motioned to her watch. Dinger bowed to Mike and Kate and waved goodbye as he followed the assistant off the down, down the hall. We have to go too, Kate said. We're supposed to be meeting George. And I think that's probably the place I have to end it. So Mike and Kate are hopefully gonna watch the Colorado Rockies game, but they do encounter another dinosaur and they encounter some strange things happening with the baseballs in the humidor. So that's a quick introduction to the ballpark mysteries and a quick introduction to the Colorado curveball. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions that people have. So uh, Emily, I don't know if we have questions, but uh, happy to answer them. We do have some questions. Thank you, David. Great. So our first question comes from Oliver, grade two, and he wants to know, how do you choose which stadium to write about for each one? Wow, great question. So nice to meet you, Oliver, and thanks for asking the question and possibly reading the ballpark mystery books. So it turns out um, there are 30 major league baseball teams and what I've done is, as I told you, I started off with uh, the Red Sox and the Yankees because uh, they were close to home and such a great rivalry. But after that, if you take a look at the map of all the major league teams, they're kind of spread out across the United States, although California actually has five of those 30 teams. So if you really like baseball, you might want to move out to California. Um, what I try to do is I try to move my characters basically around the map to different cities kind of distribute them a little bit. So if I've done a couple of teams on the East Coast, I'm gonna do some on the West Coast or in the center of the country. And I've also tried to pick teams that are interesting for one reason or another. Um, so the Colorado Rockies, I hadn't done a team in a while that was kind of in the center of the country. I'd done some Chicago teams, I'd done West Coast teams, but I hadn't done Colorado Rockies. So I thought that would be a good one. And um, that's, that's kind of how I pick. I just try to move my characters around to different locations so that um, they can see a lot, a lot of different parts of the United States. Great. Um, this question comes from Ryan, the son of Alan Fasano, MSA 2006. Yep. How many more ballpark mysteries will you write and how do you get new ideas for stories? Good question. Okay, so thanks for asking that question. That's an excellent question. How many more will I write and how do I get the ideas for the stories? So um, how many more I write? I'm not sure. I hope to write about all 30 teams. So far I've written about 16 of them. The Colorado book is the 16th in the series. There's actually two more that are coming. So I'm actually writing a book about them. I've written a book about the Minnesota Twins baseball team that will come out next year. And I'm actually currently this week, today, later today, 
working on my Atlanta Braves mystery, and that will come out the following year. And then hopefully after that, that'll, that'll take us up to number 18 uh, teams that I've written about, but hopefully I'll be able to write about more. If the books keep selling, then I'll be able to keep writing about uh, more major league teams, and hopefully we'll get to all 30. So that's how many teams I hope to write about. And in terms of getting the ideas, um, so usually when I start writing a book, I actually don't have any idea what the mystery is going to be about. And again, using the Colorado book as the example, I do the research here at home at my desk and on the internet. And then I take the trip out to Colorado and I end up with a list of all kinds of interesting things about the team or the stadium, like the baseballs and like the dinosaurs and things like that. And then I basically just sit down at this desk and I try to come up with an interesting mystery. So um, I usually get the ideas for the mystery based upon something I've seen on the, on the trip, the research trip, or based upon something that's really unique or interesting about the team or the stadium. So for example, when I was writing about the Chicago Cubs, the Chicago Cubs play in Wrigley Field. It's one of the oldest baseball stadiums in the major leagues and it's very different. And one of the important things about the Chicago Cubs stadium is the outfield wall. You know, some stadiums have a fence, they have a wall. It's a brick wall and it's covered with ivy and you can see that ivy on the cover. And so I knew that the ivy had to be an important part of the mystery, but I wasn't really sure what the mystery was going to be. And then I thought actually it might be cool to kind of have like a treasure hunt going on. And so what turns out in this book is somebody is cutting down the ivy because they believe that there's a treasure buried in the wall behind the ivy. So that's how I kind of tied that mystery um, into, into the, the history of Wrigley Field. So when I'm looking at the fields, I'm looking for interesting things. And then I also actually try to combine that. There's a lot of different ways to write a mystery. You can write a mystery about something missing or stolen. You can write a mystery about something supernatural like a ghost. You can write a mystery where mysterious things are happening and we don't know why. You could write a mystery about something counterfeit or something that's fake. So I did that in book number nine when they go to Philadelphia and there's a fake mascot or a counterfeit mascot. So there's a lot of different ways to write a mystery story. And I try to combine that with the interesting things that I see on the research trip. So thank you. That was a great question. That was a great question. I learned a lot too. I'm a Chicago Cubs fan myself. So I enjoyed yeah. hearing about that book. Um, our next question comes from one of our colleagues' son, Charles O'Brien. He actually had you scheduled to visit his elementary school during this period of time. So this worked out well. What was right. the first baseball game you've been to? Wow, the first baseball game I went to in my life was, I think it was a New York Mets game. And that would have been back in the 70s, um, dating myself a little bit. Um, I lived, uh, I grew up actually in central New York and I was about four, four and a half hours from New York City and four hours from Boston. Um, but we went down, took a day trip down to New York City to see a New York Mets game. Although I will have to admit that my favorite team at that time was the Baltimore Orioles because I really liked the logo and the little Oreo. Um, and I, we didn't really have a home team. Um, so that was, my, that was my favorite team. Great. Our next question comes from Manny Ventura. How did you promote your books? Okay, great question, Manny. How do I promote my book? So um, this series has been out for um, about, about nine years at this point. Um, and um, we usually promote, we usually release one or two books a year. And it's published by Random House, which is a large publisher, and they publish a lot of books every year. Um, and so initially when the first, when the series first came out, they did some promotion of the series. Um, I actually went down to spring training, I think the first or second year to kind of promote the books and introduce them to possible readers. Um, and they did some advertising, but as the series goes on, um, it basically becomes kind of self-sustaining. So most of the promotion is something that I do as an author and the things I do to promote the book are things like school visits. So I go and visit schools and talk to children about reading and writing and how to write a mystery. Um, I also uh, go to book festivals and author festivals, and those are a lot of fun. There's a lot in the fall, a lot in the spring, get to meet readers, uh, people that are fans of the ballpark mystery that don't know about them yet, and I get to meet other authors, and that's always fun. Uh, sometimes I do some promotion online, so some Facebook ads. If I have a new book coming out, I might do some Facebook ads in a local area. Um, I also have an email newsletter. You can go to my website, which is davidakellybooks.com, 
You can sign up for my email newsletter and you can also look at some of the other resources I have on the website. Uh, so I do have a newsletter that I send out when new books get released or something interesting is going on. And um, those are some of the ways I do promotion. I also do webinars and um, online uh, meetings and Skype visits. Again, when school resumes in the fall or later this spring, um, I offer free Skype visits on selected days or like 15 minute Skype visits with classes or schools. So it's a great way to kind of connect with children and uh, talk to them about writing. But those are some of the ways I do the promotion. But that's one of the things as any author, um, unless you're perhaps uh, JK Rowling or someone like that, all of the authors that you see are basically doing mostly their own promotion and working with other authors to kind of reach out to potential readers. So thank you very much for the question. That was a great one. We do have a question that probably pertains to the last question and might be easy to answer. What is your favorite baseball team now? Wow, good question. What's my favorite baseball team now? I have two favorite baseball teams. Since I live in Newton and uh, near Boston, I'd have to say the Boston Red Sox are uh, my favorite baseball team. And my second favorite baseball team is whatever team I'm writing about. So right now it's the Atlanta Braves. Um, and uh, I actually have a, a soft spot in my heart for the Atlanta Braves because they actually came um, and stayed back in the 70s and even before uh, the teams used to play, major league teams used to play in Cooperstown, New York. And I lived about 45 minutes away from Cooperstown, New York. And uh, they would come to play a Hall of Fame Day game. And in 1974, I think, or maybe 73, the Atlanta Braves came, I think it was 74, uh, came to play the uh, game in Cooperstown. They stayed overnight in the town that I lived in, which was New Hartford. And uh, I actually got to meet Hank Aaron uh, the morning before that game down at the hotel they were staying at. And I got him to sign a ball that I had. So that was my connection uh, to Hank Aaron and the Atlanta, the Atlanta Braves. And I'm actually kind of working uh, a, a lot of Hank Aaron into the Atlanta Braves mystery that I'm writing right now. So great question. That's cool. Um, quite, this question comes from Tim Hunter, also grade two. He wants to know, have you ever written about Little League? Tim, so thank you for the question. Um, yes, I have, and I highlighted that a little bit before, but um, uh, the World Series Kids, which just came out last summer, is a Little League World Series mystery. And so again, my characters, Mike and Kate, are not in Little League, or they're not in Little League in this book, but Mike and Kate are at Williamsport. You've probably seen the Little League World Series on TV. It's broadcast in the summer in August, and what a lot of fun to watch. Uh, my son, Scott, uh, actually made it to the state finals for the Little League uh, World Series. He didn't make it beyond the state, but it was, certainly was exciting. But Mike and Kate are in Williamsport, and someone is trying to kind of mess up uh, the team from Cooperstown. And so Mike and Kate have to investigate that. And it was fun because it was kind of a different kind of a mystery since it wasn't a major league mystery. Um, it actually has a little bit more emotion than some of my books. There's a lot more going on in terms of what's there. And also... Um, watching the Little League World Series in Williamsport is pretty amazing. They have like 50,000 people there to watch these games. And it's, it's truly a really neat experience if you ever have a chance to go. So thanks for the question. Well, I know you mentioned your son played baseball, but Allie Lynch uh, or Claire, excuse me, grade two, would like to know, did you play baseball? Claire, great. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Claire. Um, I did play baseball. I played minor league and a little bit of little league. But um, I wasn't a great baseball player. I usually played right field or center field. And I wasn't hitting a lot of home runs like Babe Ruth. I was kind of lucky if I made it to first base. I also played baseball in my backyard. We had a lot of kids that lived around us. And um, I played baseball in my backyard for many years. Um, I did not play baseball in high school or college. Uh, but as I said, I mentioned my son, Stephen um, and Scott. I have two sons. They played a lot of baseball. And they're actually the reason that I wrote the books because Back when they were uh, in second and third grade, they were reading a lot of mystery books. They used to love the A to Z mysteries and other mysteries. And they were also reading a lot of sports books like Matt Christopher sports books. And they were playing a lot of baseball. And I kind of thought maybe it'd be cool to put that all together. And I looked around to see if there were any baseball mysteries or even sports mysteries. And there weren't. There were sports books and there were mystery books, but there weren't any sports mysteries. And I thought, this seems like a really great idea. Somebody should write some baseball mysteries. And I thought I'd give it a try. So that's how I ended up writing the ballpark mysteries. Um, and it took me 
it took me about four years to figure out how to write them before the first one was uh, published or accepted. Uh, it's you have to be awfully persistent if you want to be a writer. But if you have a good idea and you're willing to work at it and you're willing to revise your work and listen to what people say, I think actually anybody can be a writer. So that's a really great question. Thanks. A good follow up to that that was asked was when did you publish your first book? So the first book was published. Um, the first book that came out was actually this one, Babe Ruth and the Baseball Curse. It was published in 2009. And the first of the Ballpark Mysteries, uh, the Fenway Foul Up, was published two years later in 2011. So I had the idea to write this Red Sox mystery. And uh, because my sons were reading mysteries and, and playing baseball, and I, I wrote the first version of a Red Sox mystery. I put a lot of work into it. It took me about a year to write it because I was doing other things. I was working in marketing because I have a, an MBA in marketing from Bentley. And I had a regular job and I was trying to do the writing. And after a year, I felt I had a really good story and I sent it into an editor at a publishing company in New York. And they read it. And about a month later, I got a letter back. And the letter said my story was terrible. Uh, it was, wasn't written well, the sentences were too long, the words were too hard, the mystery was bad, and my characters were bad. There really wasn't much that was good about it. But the only thing that good came out of that was that the editor said that she would read another story. If I revised it, she'd be willing to read it again. So I revised it, I sent it back in, and I really hoped it was going to be better. And about a month later, I got a second letter back from the editor, and she said, it's still terrible. Um, it still wasn't written well, the mystery wasn't good, there were still problems with the characters, but she said, I like the way you write the appendix. So in these books, I didn't really discuss it, but in these books, I have an appendix that has some nonfiction information about each of the teams or the stadium. So you can learn a little bit about the Red Sox or the Yankees or the Colorado Rockies. She said, I like the way you write that, would you write a nonfiction book for us? And I said, sure, I'll write anything you want. So at that point, she said, why don't you write a book about Babe Ruth? So that's how I ended up writing this book. And again, the first version of this book actually wasn't very good either, but my editor helped me make it better and more interesting. So we published this book. And then when the, once this book was published, she said, why don't you go back and see if you can write the mystery again, work on it again now that you've written the first book. So I, even though the, the, the mystery was the first idea that I had, it took me a while to get to the point where it was good enough to be published. So long question long answer to your question but i hope it was interesting yeah that was great uh, we also have another follow-up question to that from jessica sloan how did you and your illustrator pair up and how did you find your publisher good question so i'm going to take the publisher one first thank you for asking the question jessica um so i found the publisher because i had the idea for um for these I do baseball mysteries. Hey, I want to write some baseball mysteries. I'm going to start with the Red Sox mystery. And I had kind of written a first draft of it, or actually, I think I'd had the first draft completed. And I was trying to find an agent because usually in publishing, you find an agent and an agent is someone who represents you. And then they bring it to different publishers. And I was having trouble finding an agent. So what I did is I went on the internet. And again, these books are a lot like the A to Z mystery books by an author by the name of Ron Roy. And he publishes mysteries that are, you know, a, 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 based on letters of the alphabet. And I went to his website and I asked him if he had an agent that I could talk to. And he responded to me, which was really generous of him. And he said, I don't have an agent, but I have an editor at Random House. Uh, would you like their contact information? And I said, yes. So I emailed the editor at Random House and asked if I described my idea and asked if I could submit the story. And that editor said yes. Uh, but of course, then that editor said no and no and no when I submitted the story. Um, but that's how I actually got connected with my editor at Random House. And then after the first book was published, when I was working on this book, I finally got an agent. And I have an agent now who represents me. And the second question you had was about the illustrator. So the illustrator for the Ballpark Mysteries is uh, Mark Mayers. And you can see this is the type of illustrations that he does. Uh, I think they're really great. Um, he's illustrated all 20 books of the Ballpark Mystery Series. And the books also have, you know, black and white illustrations inside. I showed you some of those when I was reading. And I didn't do anything to find him. So as, a, as an author, you submit your work to the publishing company. 
And then they're going to find the illustrator to pair you with. So they were looking for an illustrator who could draw sports. They wanted a certain look. They also wanted an illustrator who was available. So if they picked a really famous illustrator, not only would that famous illustrator be expensive, but when you're starting to produce two or three books a year, that's actually a lot of illustration. So you have to pick somebody who actually has the time and the space to do the illustration. And they selected Mark. And I don't know if Mark had done any other previous books or if he had just done like magazine, children's magazine illustrations. Um, and they work with him. So I don't have a lot of input on the illustrations. I write the story. I send it to my editor uh, at Random House in New York City. And they decide what's going to be illustrated. They look for at least one scene in each chapter. And they will describe the illustration they want to the illustrator to Mark. And I they believe they also send him uh, my manuscript. So he has the words. He has a, a concept of what is going on with the story. And the same thing happens with the cover. So the cover is actually decided by a group of people at Random House. My editor and a bunch of other editors um, will sit around at a table and they'll decide on what the cover should look like. So my editor will propose some ideas and they'll come up with what it should look like. And there's also actually an art director who's involved at, at the publishing company. So there's a lot of people involved in the illustration. I don't have much input. So um, I send off the manuscript. They'll send me some sketches um, of, the, of the illustrations that Mark does. If I have a problem with them, if there's like a mistake, I can provide feedback. Um, but if I just don't like what he's done, they don't have to take my advice. Like if I want the guy to be taller or shorter, unless I've described the person that way and he's doing it wrong, it's basically up to the, to the illustrator and my editor how they want the characters to look. So that's, that's kind of how the illustrations work. And the same with the other books. So Miracle Mud, um, I wrote the story. It took me about 14 times of submission to get it to the point where someone would accept it and lots of revisions. And they selected Oliver Dominguez. Uh, Oliver did a great job uh, doing the illustration. He lives down in Miami, Miami I think. Um, he's not connected with Mark. And then when we did the MVP books, the illustrations you can see are, are different. They're a different type of illustration than the ballpark mysteries. These are a little bit more cartoony, a little bit more abstract. There's a little bit less um, going on in them. And that was a stylistic choice that they made uh, when they came out with these books. They wanted them to look a little bit different from the ballpark mysteries. So that's a quick overview of the illustrators. Great. Um, here's a question from Teddy in the first grade. How did you decide to have the main characters be cousins? Okay, Teddy, thank you. What a good question. So um, how did I decide to have my main characters, Kate and Mike, be cousins? That's because when I first started writing, when, they, when Random House said we'd like a series of books, we'll take two or three of these ballpark mystery books, I wasn't really sure how I was gonna be writing them. And I, I could have made them sister and brother and that would have made a little bit more sense. But if I made them cousins, then I figured I could have two sets or two families involved and maybe that would make it more flexible and easier for me to do things because I wasn't exactly sure how they were gonna to go to all these different baseball stadiums and what they were gonna do. And I figured if I had more options, if they were from different families, it would be easier for me to write the story. Now, as I've written all the books, it actually doesn't really matter. And if I had to do it over again, I might make them brother and sister. It doesn't really matter because um, Mike is always kind of tagging along. I think in the, uh, the only book in which Mike's family actually comes up is the Cooperstown book because that's where Mike and Kate live. And we see a little bit of Mike's father, I think, in that book and a little bit of his family life. But um, otherwise, I probably should have made them brother and sister, but it works just fine as cousins as well. So that's a really interesting question. Thank you. Great, now we have two final questions that are talking about your future plans. Sure. Um, the first question comes from Will, grade five, and he wants to know, do you have plans to write a series for older readers who grew up reading your books and are now in middle school? Wow, good question, Will. Um, I, would, um, I would like to write a series for older um, children, but I haven't done that yet. I have thought about it, and I don't know if I'm going to do it in the near future. I'm, I'm working on more ballpark mystery books, I actually have an idea for another series. It might be a monster mystery series. And I have some ideas for other picture books that I'm working on. So I do have a number of projects. I have thought about kind of a middle grade series, which would be interesting. 
Um, and maybe, maybe next year or the year after I'll get to that. So that would be fun to do because I know a lot of kids have read my books. It would be kind of fun to have them uh, be able to step into something else. So it's something I'm continuing to think about, but I don't have specific plans at the moment. So good question. And what was the next one? The last question is, will you write these books about other sports too? Good question. Will I write the books about other sports? So, you know, we wrote the MVP books about some other sports. They're not a series, you know, it's not a, a series on, on other sports. Um, maybe I'll do more MVP books, which would have other sports. I know I've got a lot of requests for like hockey books um, and actually dance and gymnastics books. Um, and maybe I'll have a chance to do those. I actually did start to write a football mystery series, but it was harder to write than, than the baseball mystery series because football teams don't have as many games as the baseball teams do. They also practice in a different place than they play. So on Sundays they play in a stadium, but usually they're practicing in other facilities. And it wasn't really easy to get some characters, you know, two kids that would be kind of hanging around these practice facilities in a way that made sense the way you can in a baseball stadium. So we'll see, maybe there'll be some other mysteries I'll be able to write about other sports. I'm always looking for ideas and um, I'm continuing to write. So thank you very much for the questions. I will say we had one final question, which I hope won't take too long for you to answer, but yep. maybe it will. <laughs> if you weren't an author, what would you be? Well, that's a good question. Um, I've been a lot of things. Um, and that's one of the things I never kind of knew what I wanted to be when I was growing up. And so what I've found is I basically, as I've gone through my life, I've just followed things that I'm interested in or I'm curious about. So um, I actually did technology for many years. I, I was into computers and technology, a programmer, a product manager. Um, I started writing about technology and then I went to Bentley College. I got a degree in marketing and I started doing a number of marketing type jobs. Um, I've also worked in restaurants as a busboy and um, I've written travel articles for newspapers and that was a lot of fun to kind of get paid on, go on vacation and write about it. And um, I'm really happy to be writing children's books now and I think I'm going to continue to do that. Um, but I think the most, uh, the best thing to do is basically just pursue things that you're interested in or that you're curious about. And um, it's, it's a great way to learn new things and to always be um, kind of thinking and, and learning new things. So that's, that's my advice. Awesome. Well, that was a good place to end for today. We want to thank you, David, for your time. And we hope all of you Falcons and future Falcons enjoy reading about baseball in the absence of baseball right now. Um, and we had a great time visiting with you, David. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. And uh, thank everyone for asking the questions and keep reading and uh, keep writing.